Uh, we're going to give them some test spaces. So I'm going to use OneNote and record, and we're going to see how it goes. Okay, so this will be online. Is it going? Is it working okay? Yeah. So there's a big microphone. So, do you want to go sing a song carry over the app? Professor Martin will be able to get that. Um, okay, so the next question is 8 6. That is, the, that is the, the flip to the other day. Remember the other day, the government said, when you have a replacement, replacement of the property and it's land a building, but we'll let you mess around with the proceeds so it's not nearly as painful if you put a lot of proceeds into one asset and not the other one. We'll let you kind of mess around with the proceeds, reallocate the proceeds. 13, 21.1, 13 back to 21.1 is the, op, the other side of the coin where basically you sell land and building and they don't like how you allocate it then they're going to basically reallocate the way they like it, okay? So they, they're not necessarily with one hand, they slap you with the other hand on, on 13, 21, 21. So the, the way you look at it is, the other thing was an election, you get to pick, 13, 21, 21. This is required. This is not election, this is required. And it's only for land and building, okay? So land and building are, are sold at the same time. And this is where, as I, as I mentioned a couple classes, I believe what you should do is once this term, and again, you know, I, I joked in the first class, you get bonus marks if you actually open this thing up. This is the tax act that we're, that we're doing. What does 1321.1 say? Notwithstanding, what does notwithstanding mean? What does notwithstanding mean? Yep. Like even when? Ignore. Ignore what normally happens. So screw it, don't worry about it. That, that, whatever happens under that normal, Proceeds disposition, forget. It's not applicable. Ignore it. We're going to tell you what's going to happen. So basically, notwithstanding what you normally would do, the, the definition of proceeds disposition in a particular year, um, where at any point in time, tax year, the taxpayer disposes of the building, right? And the proceeds are less than the capital cost, and UCC, basically the cost of the UCC, this rule applies. Okay? So basically, what they're saying here is if you have an asset and a building, where you have a terminal loss, this is what happens. Okay? So regardless of how you want to allocate proceeds, this rule kicks in. Okay? Makes sense? So that's why, if you can read all this stuff in the textbook, if you read right there, it's very clear. If this happens, then you have to follow these rules. Okay? Not election, it's required. So let's look at the problem. So 13, or 8-6, here. I use the one note, sorry. Okay. Okay, who wants to help me with this question? Anybody ready to go? Who wants to help me with this question? Anybody ready to talk about it? Sorry, just one This is going to be purely a lecture day, isn't it? <laughs> I guess I'll see when I see the check marks. Okay. This this basically basically says this gentleman has a property, land and building, and he's gonna sell it. And what's gonna happen is the people who are buying it are gonna knock down the building and build something on top of the spot. Okay? That should say to you, what's the value what's the what's the value of the building that he has right now? Okay? What's the yeah, need? Zero, yeah. right? Why? Because if I'm going to demolish it, they're going to demolish it. Is it worth anything? No. Even if it's got, you know, stuff in it and stuff like that, they're going to demolish it. The value is zero. So guess what happens? Because the value of the building is zero, which is less than the cap or the UCC, 1321.1 applies. 1321.1 applies. Okay? Everybody agree? So the first thing you have to say is because the proceeds are less than. Uh, just to call our UCC, 13, 21, Okay? You gotta do that in the front, otherwise you, you lose a mark for identifying why you're even using 13, 21, 21. Okay, so building will be destroyed or demolished, therefore proceeds are zero, proceeds are less than UCC, therefore 13, 21, 21 applies. Okay, everybody good? You have to go through that logic, otherwise you lose a couple marks. And when you get to professional exams, the logic has to follow because there's a lot of marks taking you from here to here along the way. Okay? So who wants to, who need, are you ready to do this or you want to? 
hand off, back away. Okay. Yeah. Anybody, anybody want to help me do 1321.1 here? Okay, what, what, what do you want to do? Yeah? Um, are we just looking at whether or not the building has a terminal or not? No. No. What, what we're going to do is we already know that, right? Because the proceeds are zero and we have the UCC, right? So you don't have to go through a lot of work. Okay, so why don't we, step one, let's do the calculations as though 1321.1 did not exist. So calculations as if no 1321.1. Okay, so let's just do hypothetical, okay? Somebody want to help me this? Okay. Somebody walk me through what happens. There was no 1321.1. What would happen? How would you file your tax return? Sophia? Um, yeah. Okay, so you're going to start with the building. So you're going to pick up an asset, right? So you're selling landed building. We know we sold the landed building, or disposed of, sorry, disposed of a landed building. We have to report those, right? So basically what we're going to do is building. So open UCC. How much is that? 350000 Oh, shit. Talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry about that. Okay, um, UCC was 30000 Opening UCC. Oh, wait. Opening UCC is 140 minus 35. Good. That's it. <laughs> 103? Yep. Okay. So, since the proceeds are zero, then that's the we had a UCC balance of 103 start the year. We now know that we don't have the asset anymore. It's gone. Proceeds were zero. Therefore, we have UCC before CCA of 103. We have a positive balance in the pool. No assets left. What happens? Okay. If there wasn't for this special rule we're going to look at in a second, this is what would happen for the building, right? Sophia, what else you got to do? Remember, you have landed building. You need to report how you're going to treat both of those, okay? So what are you going to do? So the cost was 80. So the proceeds were a million. Yep. Right? So proceeds dispositions are a million. ACV is 80. This is going to get posted, guys. So don't, if, unless you're taking notes yourself, this will all be there. P of B of a million, ACV of 80, capital gain of 920, taxable capital gain at half inclusion rate is 460. Okay, so therefore, the taxable income impact of the sale equals how much? How much taxable income will they report? 460 minus 103, 357. Everybody agree? 103 terminal loss is a deduction. 460 capital gain, taxable capital gain. Therefore, the difference between the two is what this taxpayer will report on their taxable income for this transaction. Okay, everybody good? So that is our there wasn't such a 1321.1. But there is. Applying rules of 1321.1. Okay, who's going to help me do this? Okay, so what happens here in 1321.1? We'll go through the math a little bit, and I'm going to explain to you how you can actually see how they, what the concept and policy was, and it's pretty easy to see what they were up to. Okay? What do you think they want to do? Yep. Yeah. The terminal loss uh, reduced the 
reduces the capital gains. Okay, that's the intention, right? So what they want to do is you have a capital gain over here and a terminal loss over there. Their intention is to recharacterize that terminal loss into out of there, make the terminal loss go away, and basically at the same time reduce the capital gain. Okay? That's what that's what the intention of what this rule is all about. It's basically saying you can't have a deduction here of 100% and an income inclusion over here of 50%. We don't like that. We want we want to fix that. So, Akash, what do you want to do here? So, um, for the capital gains calculation, then your proceeds or the proceeds would be 897 for oh, the building would be uh, 103. Okay. What what this rule says? We want we want to figure out what the building is because that's what we want. We want to mess around with the building proceeds. The land is the default. Okay? So wh whatever we go through now, they're going to make us go through a process to come up with the proceeds for the building. The land is the plug. Do you agree? That's what the rule says. Okay? Take a look at 1321.1. We can pull it up. It basically says, here's the building. We're going to do a bunch of stuff to come up with the building. And the land is the plug. Okay? So, Cash, what's the, what's the calculation? You know? Um, so, the calculation that Oh, we're looking at the, the UCC part right now, or well, you have to, well, you have to come up with the proceeds. Don't worry about the don't worry about the UCC part. You have to come up with the proceeds, right? Oh, okay, because I, I just came up with the. We can't do that. I, I thought it's a lesser of the terminal loss or. or uh, don't do that. You you you're, you got to go through the rules, right? What you have to do is you have to follow the rules, which basically says determine the proceeds of the land or building, then the building. Sorry, determine the proceeds of the building, determine the proceeds of the land, then figure out what the capital issue or the taxable issues are. Okay, you got to do that. Okay, so the deemed proceeds of the building is the first thing you got to do because that's really the one they're trying to mess around with, which makes sense. We want to mess around with the land, the building. We're going to tell you what it is, give you a formula, and then after that, just tell you what the land's the difference. Okay, so Akashi, you want to take a slap or? Uh, no, I think no. Okay. Are you sorry? Did you say you want? Oh, no, sorry. You didn't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Any, anybody, anybody want to walk me through? Okay, the lesser of one, the, the uh, fair market value of land and building, which is how much? Puneet? Right. Okay, so what they're going to do here, take a look what they're going to do. Here's the total combined ba basket sale price of a million dollars. We're going to try to minimize the amount that's allocable to land. That's what they're doing and then therefore plug as much as we can to build it. That's the first part of the parameter, right? So what they're gonna do is, intuitively, they're trying to minimize the value of the land, right? So less, logically, they're gonna take a lesser of two numbers. One, fair market value, the land, and two, the ACB of the land. Why, why do they use a lesser of number? They want the land number low, the building number high. Right? So the million dollars here, the fair market value of the, band, the land is a, a million. The ACB of the land is 80. The lesser of those two numbers, 80. So that is 920. But you know what? They have a heart. We're not going to make you pay tax on $920,000 of uh, building proceeds. What we're going to do is we're actually going to take into account what the building looks like right now. So what they're going to do is, again, all in the spirit of making as much as you can allocable to the building, will be a lesser of or greater of calculation, you think? They want higher, so it's the greater of two things. Of, take a look here, fair market value of the building. So take a look, all they did was they wrote the rules as similar, right? Fair market value of the building is zero, and then What's the number there that, uh, Cash, what, what's the number you think they have to try to plug away with to get something close to the recapture number? Uh, the capital cost of the UCC. The lower, lesser of the capital cost, which is 140, and the UCC, which is 103. Right? Almost always, there are exceptions. Obviously, the UCC should be less than capital cost, right? Because you take in CCA. There are exceptions where there's adjustments to things, so that's why they do that lesser of. So the lesser of those two numbers is 103, right? And then the lesser of one and two is 103, right? So the lesser of 920 and 103 is 103. 
So look what they've done. Basically, they've said, Akash, what you said is true. Basically, they're going to basically say whatever the, recap, whatever the recapture is, that's how much we're going to basically, our terminal loss, that's what your proceeds are going to be. But you have to go through this process to make sure nothing slips through the cracks along the way in terms of odd you know, anomalies that happen in the system. Okay? So now we know. So basically, the 103 is the deemed proceeds of disposition for the building. As soon as I tell you that, next mark, next thing you're going to do is what? What's the next thing? Nasheen, what do you think you're going to do? Okay, before even that, an easy mark. Okay, we know the proceeds of disposition for the land and building. They just told us what the building is. Oh, the proceeds of the land. Let's determine the land, right? So deemed P of D of land. Well, you're here, you might as well get the easy marks, right? So it's total P of D, which is 1 million, less deemed P of D of building, 103, 897. Deemed P of D land. Everybody agree? Okay. Are we done? Okay, we've determined the proceeds of disposition for the land and building. Are we done? Thank you, machine? No. What do you got to do? You have to show the disposal of the building. The Canadian tax system automatically says when you dispose of a capital asset, you have to report it. We've disposed of capital assets. We have the proceeds. You now need to report it. Right? So, so land, P of D equals how much? 897, ACB, how much? 80. 80. Capital gain, which is going to be 817. Taxable capital gain at one half, which is 408.5. Everybody agree? Building, what are we going to do? Sophia, what did you do last time? So how do you do that? So you start with the UCC of 103. Disposal. Lower cost and proceeds. Capital costs, how much? Dean P of D. Lesser of? UCCN, zero. Okay? So everybody see what happened? By virtue of what we just did, what was originally a terminal loss has been now denied. Okay? Look what happened. There's no terminal loss anymore because your proceeds equal to your UCC. So let's just do the last check of the situation. So now your taxable Income impact of transaction with 1321.1 applying equals how much? Taxable income impact of transaction with 1321.1 applying. What do we have? How much recap how much terminal loss? Pardon? So zero, terminal loss, plus how much cap taxable capital gain? 48,500. Okay, our now, our taxable capital gain now is, our, sorry, our income inclusion is 408,500. What was it before? Versus three fifty seven without thirteen twenty one point one hypothetical. Okay. 
difference is 51.5 K. Okay, you seem to get that? Yeah, I just, I thought we wanted to lower. No, well, no, or the amount of income. Yeah. The amount of income is higher, not lower. We don't want, this is, this is an election, this is required. Uh -huh. Remember last day we did 44 6 election at relocation? That was, we elected to do that. This is required. This is the government saying we don't like something, we're going to tell you what the rules are, we're going to deem these things to happen. Hey, but what's the 51.5? What is that? All they've done is said that $103,000 terminal loss, we're not going to let you take that as a business deduction 103. We're going to convert it to a capital loss. So 103, 103,000 terminal loss at a half inclusion rate is exactly $51,500. Do that make sense? Yeah, so um, the condition is has to be not disposed the same year, right? Or this is disposed in the same year. So you have, you, you have to follow this and it's disposed in the same year. You have to, not much. No, no. Last day, we dealt with the election of, of uh, with the replacement property rule. This is a required um, provision. Okay. And the only reason I wanted to put out the without it was to show you this is this is if the rules can apply, this will happen. You guys should see. All they've done is taken a terminal loss and said, we'll let you take it, but in a half, which is basically capital loss. Right? Makes sense, Ken? Yeah? <laughs> okay, my suggestion is hopefully you can take a look at this um, again, take a look at the book, and, then, and by all means, look at the act and actually try to understand what they're doing. It's, it, it says make that. This is what happens. And this calculation is strictly speaking denying a terminal loss and saying we'll let you take uh, half of that amount as a, cap, as a reduced capital gain. That's, that's effectively what happened. No more, no less. Yeah. No, this is an election. This I mean, is required. Requirement. Regardless, if, 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 if we didn't sell the land to building and, and put numbers to them, they would ignore it. And still, if they're sold in the same year, you have to do this. Right? They're going to use your building number as a fair market value number, but guess what happens? You're still going to wind up getting through the same calculation. Right? It's contrived to, to basically make sure you, you at least get rid of the terminal loss. Okay? That's just the way the math works. Okay? Everybody good? So this will be posted, and this is actually getting recorded. So you know what? Hopefully, if you don't understand, go back and try to understand um, what we're doing. OK? Candace, is that OK, or you want to go through it again? Can we go through it? You want to go through it again? OK, which part? Um, the last part. Well, something about the terminal loss being exactly. OK, take a look what happened here. Without 1321.1, we had a terminal loss of $103,000, agree? And we had a taxable capital gain of $460,000, agree? So our net income, income implications was 357, this minus that, okay? By doing 1321.1, this number, what did it become? Yeah. And what did this number become, 460? Uh, the capital gain? Yeah, the taxable number. Hang on here, let's go back. It's okay, it's down here. Yeah, 48500, sorry, I should have. Should know, my wife tells me never to question a woman. Okay? So take a look what happened though, okay? By, by using 13, 20, this is. Right? What we've done is taken 103. Made that go to zero. And in exchange, 460 went to 408.5. So take a look what happened was this is this to zero. If you take half of that difference, this number. So if you take away 103, this is now letting you take away half of that number to get to 408.50. So 103 divided by 103 divided by 2 is $51.5,000. So basically they're saying no terminal loss. We're going to let you go over and, and treat it as a uh, reduced capital gain, basically at, at half inclusion rate. Okay? Not nearly as important. You know what? If you, if you don't get that, the most important thing is understand land and building sold together. You have to use this rule. 
And then this is how to calculate it. If you don't, you know, Candace, if you don't get it, your mind around the concept as much, the most important thing is understand. If, if land and building are sold. So, like, when you say if land and building are sold together, yeah. does the building have to be on the land or is it just the same transaction? So, it has to be the building, the land attached to the building. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. No, no. It says, like, if you're opening the app, it'll actually say the land, uh, adjacent to, subjacent to, and required for the use of the building. Okay, also my other question is, why can't we, like, you know how we did the hypothetical situation? Uh, why can't we just take the terminal loss in the hypothetical situation, divide it by two, and just subtract it from yeah, they, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do this process. <laughs> so we have to go to this couple. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you have five minutes left in the exam, and you want to try and guess the answer, and then you'll probably get a couple marks for identifying the issue and coming up with the concept, yeah. But you'll miss, you'll miss a lot of the stuff that goes on between explaining the very The problem is, 90%, 95% of the time, what you just said works. The problem is, if you don't go through the calculations and you've got a situation where something happens in your numbers and you get the wrong number, then you're going you mess it up. And you gotta, you got to tell the customer or your client that you messed up just because you were trying to shortcut it. And you know what? With tax, the more complicated, the better because you're charging more work. <laughs> That's the way it is. Because what you do is you put the appendix to a chart, you go through and show all the calculations. And you actually show the client won't understand them, they don't care, so it's like, now I know why I pay five minutes. I'm telling you the truth, that's what you gotta do. And when you got when you have complexity, you want to show them complexity. In the notes, you know, the, remember the last assignment? You don't put all that complexity in the body to the to the, to the management team. They don't understand it. You just, but you prove yourself in the notes. Okay? That's the way I would suggest. Okay? Candace, so try to go try to listen to the, the video later. Hopefully I sound better. Um, um, but uh, and if that doesn't understand, you know, we can talk about it later on, on Tuesday. All right, let's do the quiz. Everybody good so far? Oh! I have a question. Um, does this only mean that it's sold in the same year? Land and building sold in the same year. So if, it, what if it's not sold in the same Okay, so there, there is, in the book it talks about it, yeah. Okay. Let's say you sell a building, or sell the land and then the building later, then what happens is, what you just said, you actually just have to turn the lot just to that. Oh, no. so instead of doing it, the same, I don't understand why they did that. It would be easier, but they actually say that. They actually take the term of loss and then they buy it. So as long as they're related, like you just... Well, it says literally, if you sell the land and building the same year this happens, if you sell the land and building in a separate year, the building's uh, uh, loss claim, the term of loss, is actually half of the amount, otherwise you'd be able to So you think they can just do that in the industry? Yeah. <laughs> but again, complexity is your friend when you're setting up the bill. <laughs> right, or for an exam, right? I understand. So, in, in five years, if you're doing this stuff, you'll love it. Right now, you hate it. Okay. But if you, if you if you try to understand what they're trying to do, think about think about the concept really quickly. They take total proceeds. They say, how do we minimize the land number to come up with a building number? And then the other one is, how do we give you the benefit of the doubt of a building number which is reasonably close to what you what you have as a tax cost? And we'll use that. That's what they do. That's what the lesser of it. It's okay. So this requirement, did we technically, were we supposed to technically do it in problem three because they didn't sell it? <coughs> There's a key. Okay. This so. has to be the sale of the land in the year and there is a terminal loss. That's the conditions. If you make money, don't worry about it. Okay. Then you're into the situation of replacing your property with Right? Okay? So land and building sold in a year and there's a terminal loss on the building, this provision applies. Okay? Okay, let's just pull up the quiz. Anybody, any questions on the quiz? Okay, remember, the whole spirit of the new idea is lots of people said the quiz, we can get it, we can read the answers, we don't need to be school in this. Anybody, any specific questions on the quiz? You said I didn't understand why that question was that way. Anybody? Had one yet? The answer was 20 years and then indefinitely good because it, it came up as wrong. Yeah. Oh, did it? Yeah. Uh, which one are you talking about? Number two or three? Uh, two and three both of them. I mean, the first one I think is 20 and the second one is indefinitely Non capital loss can carry back three, forward, and uh, 20 years, and then the net capital loss is back three, forward, and definite. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I'm not going to be technical with that. Any of that stuff, I just throw it back to Professor Marco. Yeah, but those, those are the answers. Okay. Yeah? OK, 
Take a break? Okay. Company donates shares, research motion. They're not quite worth that anymore, I'm sure. The shares have a cost base of five and are worth 13 when they're donated. The division C deduction related to this donation will be basically half of the tax one, right? So basically, you uh, are so the, basically the amount that's included in the income is what you can deduct. So in this case, 13,000 proceeds, the proceeds, right? You should dispose of the union, you dispose of 13, minus the cost of five is eight, half of eight, four of which is included in income, therefore your deduction is four. Okay, it's just a specific provision that deals with appreciated property for our corporation. Okay, again, that's one of those ones that are, when you're looking at your marketing grade, that this will get you from 98 to 100. You know, your, your choice whether that's one of those little extra ones. I would lose sleep at night for that one. That's pretty, as Professor Marco likes to say, that's pretty nitpicky. That's a lot of check marks, eh? Okay, uh, any other questions on the quiz? Any other questions on the quiz? Okay. Go. So, yeah. Can you do like the calculations or like even? Okay, we just did, right? Eight, we just did. Oh, did you read? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight. The amount that you're about to deduct is 13. The amount of value minus five, which is cost base, so eight and a half. So basically, oh, the amount that you would include in the income is the amount that you're going to deduct. Is it better the second time? Yeah. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. And number ten, number nine. Now this is just the fundamental, this is the fundamental capital loss cap stuff, right? So you guys have to know this stuff. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna put this on the, the, the here, okay? Quiz question number nine. Okay. Okay. You had a net capital loss. Okay, remember, you have to remember, sorry, an allowable capital loss in a year. If you don't use it that year, it becomes a net capital loss, right? Everybody remember that? So you have in the year, it's called an allowable capital loss. Once cannot be used, it now becomes, what's it become? If you can't use it that year, that, that is you don't have enough capital gains to offset it, what does that number become? Anybody know? What, what do you call that? A net capital. What you have to remember, what you track on a go-forward basis is the net number, which is after the exclusion, right? So the net capital loss is uh, adjusted to inclusion rate in the year incurred, right? So if you incur a net capital loss in 1998, that number, you know, at whatever inclusion rate, that number becomes the number that we track, which is a pain in the butt. Why? Why is that a pain in the butt? It's okay. You have to know what you're Because the inclusion rates keep changing. It would be a whole lot easier if they would just say, let's just track everything on a gross basis, but they don't like that. So what you have to do is, you have to adjust, right? So in this case, what's the, uh, what was it, 1999? 1999? Oh, 2000. So 2000, the inclusion rate was, was two thirds, and the net capital loss was equal how much? 2000? So the way I would look at this stuff, and, and, and the way you're never gonna get yourself trip, tripping on this stuff, is realize that $2,000 is adjusted down, right? It is the net number, not the gross number. So if I were you, and I'm doing this question, automatically what I would do is flip it back, so multiply it by the reciprocal, so 2,000, I don't know what happened there, 2,000 times three over two equals 3,000, right? Everybody agree? 
That was the capital loss in 2000, right? Year. Okay, you agree, Sophia? Now we know that, right? Now what we're gonna say is what year are we in? 2011? In 2011, that capital loss equals a net capital loss of what? Okay, that, that, capital, that net capital loss from 2000 is now equal to what? What do you do? 3,000 times now today's rate equals 1,500. If you had a capital loss this year, you would automatically have it, right? You would make it in half times one half. Why don't you just gross the loss up from the previous year and then bring it back in half now? And if you're talking the same thing as you're doing everywhere else this year, everything's in half. So the secret to this thing is, and that's what the that's what the calculation is showing you in act, right? That this divided by that divided by that and all that sort of stuff. All they're doing is basically saying gross it up and then from the year that you were had the loss and make it to the year that you're trying to apply it at the, the loss of the inclusion rate the year you apply it. So in this case, you have a $2,000 net capital loss at two thirds, that equals 3,000 in 2000. Still 3,000 now, but it's, an allow, it's a net capital loss this year of 3,000 at half, which is 1,500. So in this case, your limit, your deduction is 1,500. The less you're of the taxable capital gain, you also have to do that limitation, right? The less you're of the capital gain, the taxable capital gain, and your loss can enter. In this case, you know. You got it? So 1,500 is a number because it's lower than what you have as, as the, as the, the taxable capital gain. Everybody get that? You need to understand that because you know what? It's, 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 it's so simple, but if you don't understand it, you're, you're going to screw up those questions all the time. You're going to chase your, you're going to chase your tail. Okay. Take the, take the net capital loss of the year you had it, gross it back up, then bring it over to the year you're going to use it, and then bring it down to the net number and apply it against the, the same inclusion rate that you're using that year. It works every time. I never ever once worried about that algebra and all that stuff. All I said was gross it up, bring it over, bring it back down again to the rate that we're using that. I don't know if that makes sense. So it, it, trust me, it works, and you'll never, you'll never want to lose it. Okay. Is that good on the quiz? Whoever asked that? Okay. Uh, we are on problem 11.1. One. One. Now these are the types of questions. If you get the if you get the key concepts, these you should just smile and say, I love those questions. This is this is a great question to kind of rock and roll on. Honestly, you should be able to kind of zip, 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 and be able to get some great marks. Okay? The reason I say is once you get the hang of it, there really isn't a whole lot of trick to it other than doing the math. Okay. Okay, who wants to? Let me just pick a couple people here. Um, not a lot of people, eh? Do you have any you want to give it a shot? Yeah. Okay. Want to give a little bit of help? Yeah. Okay. Now we do this question. Okay. Good. So we work from year to year. Okay. So first we start off 2008. So baby, you're going to set up a chart, right? Yep. So you're going to do 11-1. You're going to go 2008, 2009, 2010. 2011, right? Yeah. So in 2008, we first add up all the income first. So it's 54,000 plus 42,500. Okay, sorry? How did you do it? Like our income from business and our dividend income. Okay. So the total is 96,500. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go slow, okay? Okay. Okay, so what I would do is go across. That's what they, even, they kind of recommend, go across. And that way, basically, you're tracking things as they go across, okay? So 3A, this is one of those times, if you, uh, if you get some free time. Remember 
the beginning of the course, I talked about ordering and sourcing. Right? Sourcing means what? What does sourcing mean? All of your income deductions have to be put into a type of income and into a type of you know, into a jar. Okay, that's what sourcing means. Right? And you'll see again in 18 months when you're doing the internet or the, uh, the foreign tax credits and stuff, the sourcing becomes important how you do how you do tax credits and stuff like that. So sourcing means Every income and expense has to be put in a bucket by geography and by type of income, right? So when you have an expense, you got to touch, you got to attach to some income. Okay. Ordering is what this is. This is Section Three of the Act, and what this says is this is how you come up with your income for tax purposes if you the income. Okay. Three Section Three is all about coming up with income for tax purposes, which is division B income. Okay. So whenever somebody says what is your income for tax purposes or your division income? This tells you how to get that. Without this, you'd be kind of going like this. What, what do I do? What do I do? This is the math of what we should do. Three A, and that's why I put maybe when you see they actually put three A and they show some stuff. This is the three A they're talking about. Oh. Okay. Determine the total of all amounts, each of which is the tax taxpayer's income for the year, from a source inside and outside. We've got one source inside and outside Canada without restricting the foregoing with office employment. This is what we've done so far in this course. We go from office, employment, which office is generally a directorship, uh, business and property. So we, before we got here, we now set it up that we understand what we're doing. So we now have all the inputs to that. So determine amounts. So taxpayers' income. That's the same taxpayers' income or loss. So 3A are only items that are positive amounts. Right? So when you look here, 3A is only positive amounts. Okay? And that's why I want to make sure we get this right. Okay? So, so Vivian, yeah. let's go through the problem now based on what I just said. Okay? And separate, don't, 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 don't merge them. Keep them line by line separate, okay? And you'll see why in a minute. Okay, so what do we got? What's your business income? Uh, okay. Uh, yep. Um, it's negative Vivian? Three A. Negative 75, what's this, pardon? Zero. Does not go here, right? And? Um, okay, important that you understand, don't put negative things up here. And you're gonna see why in a few minutes, okay? And, and I'll show you why the definitions worked out. Okay, what, what's next, Vivian? Um, so okay, so property. Income, which was? Uh, 42.5. Yep. 22.5 for the year. Yep. 18. Yep. And 10.5. Okay. Do we have any other, any other income from office employment or property? Okay. It's a company, so there's no employment income anyway, right? So this is your 3A number. 96.5, 54.5, 18, 73, okay? Here we go. 3B, 3B, look what it says, okay, remember, you don't get the definition of division of the income without going through this stuff. So look what happens. Determine the amount, if any. What does that mean? Determine the amount, if any. So we write any capital gains we have. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to total the positive amounts and the negative amounts. And net them. Right? So basically, that's what we're saying. I is the, the positives, exceeds the amount which the uh, allowable business does not Capital losses, sorry. Allowable capital loss. So basically, 3I is tax for capital gains. Three little little two or little i two is uh, uh, net capital losses or allowable capital losses in that number. The reason I, I point out the amount of any is if it's negative, it's deemed to be zero. So the long short of it is three b cannot be negative. So that's that's how we basically say if capital losses exceed capital gains in here, you put a zero for b. Okay. And that's where you see it. That's, that's exactly why that does happen. Okay? So let's, maybe let's do this, okay? Okay, last one for you. We'll do B and then we'll move on, okay? So, Vivian? We have a taxable oh. capital gain of 
3B. So I'm going to put a 3B here. Taxable capital gain, 11. So you're 11, 2.5. Five, and then nine. And then nine, yep. Yep. So yep. What are you going to put here? Uh, the second one? Yeah. Zero. <coughs> right? The reason this is zero is because 3B cannot be negative. As soon as you see, as soon as you do this, as soon as you do this, what are you going to do? Or sorry, put this here. Anybody tell me? As soon as you override the negative number and make it zero, or what do you think is going to happen? Bingo. That is your net capital loss for the year. So as soon as you got, you, as soon as the door got slammed on you and said, "Look, you can't claim all this," that is your net capital loss. So what you're going to go down here is put note number one. Net capital loss. Four point five minus two point five, which equals two, four. What's that? Pardon? For, uh, I was just saying for two thousand nine. Okay, hang on. So two thousand dollars for two thousand and ten. Okay, so let's just leave that for now. Okay, so all we've done there is we've kind of said make note we've got a loss here. We're going to use that somewhere else, right, Vivian? Somewhere else, right? Okay. Three C. What the three three C says: determine the amount, if any, by which all of those A and B, so the sum of A and B, which is dead, exceeds the division E deductions. Right. So basically, all we do is add those two numbers up. We just did A and B. Take off some deductions that are division subdivision E. Anybody know what those are? Really doesn't apply to companies, right? Anybody know what, what's the subdivision E? That's the deductions in section 60 to 66. Moving expenses, uh, childcare expenses, RSP deductions, those things. That's where they come up. So what we would do is, in our case, because it's a company, that those apply. We're just going to add A and B, and that becomes your 3C number. If you're doing this for an individual, you would be able to take off alimony. Child care expenses, moving expenses, RSPs, this is where it would come up. But because we, this is a company, 3C amount, it's going to just simply be this plus this, right? So that's 105.5, 54 uh, 19.5, 82. Anybody disagree? Again, the reason this is good because this is going to explain what we're doing next. Okay. What does 3D say? That was straight. Determine the amount, if any, by which amounts in C exceeds each of the amounts which are losses and allow the business investment losses. So this is where you take the negative number that I told you. Don't do it here. This is where you take your negatives. Okay. So you take the positive numbers. Take out the miscellaneous deductions to come up with 3C. And now what you're going to do is, you know, you're going to deduct anything that's negative and allow uh, allowable business investment loss. What is an allowable business investment loss? Anybody know? Any, one minute or less? Anybody know? Chuck? Allowable business investment loss, anybody? Anybody see one? Okay. What allowable business investment loss is?
Just go sidebar, allowable business investment loss is loss on sale, or I shouldn't say sale, loss on disposition of uh, shares or debt, I shouldn't say or, or debt of a small business corporation. Okay? So when you lose money on the sale or disposition or on the disposition of a small business corporation, it's a special kind of capital loss, right? So enable is a special kind of capital loss. So what you do is you're going to do the same mechanics that you normally do. Proceeds of disposition minus your cost equals a capital loss. That is your business investment loss. Take a half. That is your allowable business investment loss. Okay? So, so the business investment loss is the, the 100% loss. The able is one half of the business investment loss equals amount deductible. Okay? Everybody get that? So it's just like any other capital loss, but it's a special kind of capital loss. Why is it special? Why is it special? Capital losses are only deductible for what? Uh, only against capital gains. Right? Capital losses are only allowed to be deducted, deductible against capital gains, in fact, with capital gains. Allowable business investment losses, I put three pieces. There's no limitation here. This is where basically any act, they go into that special treatment for allowable business investment loss. Right, which says you don't have to worry about if there's taxable capital gains this year. If you have a business, a lot of business type of loss, you can deduct it against your employment income. You can deduct it against your business income. 3D is where that happens. And again, that's why this section is so important because nowhere else in the act of that left that happen. Right? So that's where they allow you to do that. Okay? The only other thing I would say is anybody know what a small business corporation is? I'll just give you a real quick, you just sidebar, you're going to see this again. 90% uh, involved in active business in Canada. Remember we've talked about how the government likes to promote active business? That's the type of business you're looking at. And controlled by Canadian residents. Don't, I mean, it's not nearly as important for this course. Okay? You'll see that again in again, 18 months when you do that course. When you talk about qualified small business shares, that's not because we important. But suffice it to say, you have a business investment loss, which is a capital loss of a special nature. The able is the half of that, which is the amount that you're allowed. Right? No rocket science. Business investment loss is the gross number. The allowable business investment loss is the number that you're allowed to deduct. Right? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's carry on. So we got three C. So now we're going to do three D, which is what are we going to look for? What are we going to do here, guys? Yep. Okay. All our losses, um, including allowable business losses, so that pretty much just be uh, zero for 2008 and nine, and seventy-five thousand. Okay, so you're going to go zero, zero. Yep. Okay, ables? Uh, I think ables are, are zero. There are no ables? There is an able in 2008. Okay. So all they said in 3D is basically take the three, take the positive number we just had, subtract losses and ables, and now you're going to come up with 3D. 
Okay, so now we're going to subtract them. So 105.5 minus 3.75 is 101.75. I think, is that right? 54.5. Wait, what? Tell me what happens here. Pardon? Why do you say that, Arnold? Okay, hang on. Why did you do that? Where, 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 where does that come from? Yeah, why, why is it negative? Yeah, okay, but why, why would you, why would you not, why, sorry, why does the negative become zero? Because it's carried forward, I guess it's carried forward to zero. Let me, let me show you. This is why I tell you guys, this book, it is not so bad. Okay, so we just did 3 A, B, C, D, right? So we just calculated 3 D, right? So 3 D, take a look what happens here, guys. And for purposes of this part, so this is division B, this is your net income for tax purposes, look what happens. When the amount is determined under paragraph D, right there, um, where uh, the taxpayer's income for the year is amount so determined. So if that amount is positive, where an amount, where an amount, so if it's an amount that has to be a positive number, if it's determined under D, that is your division B income, right? Which is what happens in the next one, Arnold. In the other case, the taxpayer shall be deemed to have an income for the year of zero. So that is where a negative net income for tax purposes says, don't care if it's negative, sorry Charlie, zero. So that's why right there, we have a zero. Okay, that's how that happens. Now the issue is, what did I say before on, this char on these charts? What happens? If, if you override a number that was positive, or sorry, that was negative with a zero, what, what, what will happen? What should you do? Cash? Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to determine the amount that you're going to carry forward and back, right? So what you're going to do is, because this is this was a negative number, you're going to put a little note number two, and you're going to say, calculate non-capital loss for 2010. Is it 2010? Okay. So as soon as you see that you're getting overridden, a negative number is getting overridden, then what you want to do is say, okay, there should be some consolation prize for me, right? Because they're basically saying, you're negative. Sorry, Charlie, you can't use it, but we're going to give you some other credit here somewhere else. So what you're going to do is, in section 111.8, there's a definition of non-capital loss. And what do you think that ha what do you think happens there? What happens, do you think? Anybody want to tell me? Cash. Take your losses in a given year, subtract the from the division of the income to find what's going to be left over here. Okay, conceptually, you're right. What you need to, I mean, that's the right answer. But what, what I would say, effectively, what they've done is they invert, they invert this stuff. Right. So what they do is effectively say this number is bigger. It's got to be a positive number because uh, non-capital loss is a positive number. All they do is they flip the calculation. So what they're going to do is, where this was a negative, they're actually going to start and say, okay, look what they do. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Losses for the year are negative amounts. I'm sorry, sorry, negative amounts. Negative amounts. Start all over here. Neg negative amounts for the year, right? Business loss, which was how much? 75, right? Okay, and what they're going to do is they're also going to say, well, that's, that's your non capital losses, your business loss, right? There's things like dividends and net capital losses that really. They should be in and out because they're not affecting a real business situation. So what they're going to do is they're going to add deductions under Division C to keep them whole. Right. So what you're going to do is, if you were carrying on this calculation here, you were going down this column. There would be a deduction for net capital losses, and there would be a deduction for dividends. You can't take it because you're already at zero. They don't give you any value. So what they say is, okay, well, what we're going to do is 
we're going to let you regenerate the loss, or in, like to make the loss whole. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, add division C deductible items, which are basically dividends, which is how much? 18. And net capital loss, 1.5. We'll go through that calculation in a sec, okay? So this one here, we'll do that later. I ran out of room here, crap. You know what I'm gonna do? If you guys don't mind, I'm gonna pull this down here. Non-capital loss continued. Okay, so what we did here, so we're gonna have 75 plus 18 plus 1.5, is how much? 93.5, is that right? 94.5? 94.5, just like that, okay? And what they're gonna do now is, like Akash said, take off this positive amount, right? So what we said is, what was negative before, from here down, that becomes the top, and then what we're going to do is subtract what was positive at the, at the, at the top. It's going to go to the bottom. So this 19.5 here, right? We're going to add that 3C amount. Or sorry, subtract it. So less 3C amount, which is how much is that? How much? Yeah, sorry, 19.5. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong question here now. 19.5. So how much did your non-capital loss carry forward? 75. Lo and behold, look what happened. By doing the math this way, your business loss is your non-capital loss. All the other stuff's in and out, right? Which is what you want to do, right? They should be giving you credit for business loss and then you should carry forward. But you gotta go through that process of taking what was at the top, maybe at the bottom, and what was at the bottom, what was at the top, and flipping the sides. Right? Everybody see that? Vivian, is that okay? You got it? So now we know in 2010 there's a non capital loss of $75,000. When we wanna use it, we're gonna go and apply that, okay? <laughs> okay, so we have a non capital loss for 2010, but we haven't started using non capital losses yet, so let's just hold that for now. So, so that's what I said. This one and two, where something gets overridden, where you had a negative amount and they said you can't deduct it, they allow you to go down and do something else with it, which is a carry forward of the loss. Okay, that's exactly what happened. So this is your net income for tax, right? Which equals division B income. Okay, so 3D is your net income for tax. Are we done? What else you gotta do? Okay, you do not remember to come up with a tax income. Right, so right now we have division B, which is net income. We have one more set of calculations, which are your division C deductions to come up with tax one. Okay. And what are we, what are they? Yeah, Michelle. Yep. 2008, there was 42.5. 40, 40, yep. 22.5, 18, and 10.5. Okay, but you know this one. Don't forget. We're you know what we're gonna do. Let's just let's just ignore that, okay? Because otherwise we're gonna screw ourselves up. Okay. And how much is the last one? Okay. Um, Professor Markle talked a lot about dividends on the on the lecture, so I won't go too much. I didn't say if you have dividends from a Canadian company. Tax company, they are deductible because they've already paid one. They've already paid tax once. You should be able to flow them through any number of companies, and it should be tax free for the most part. Okay? You'll learn in 18 months there's a special different type of tax for private companies, but don't worry about that. Okay? So Canadian tax for Canadian dividends are deductible to Canadian companies. Okay? 
because they want to make sure that it just flows through all the other ones. Okay. Michelle, what's next? Hang on, Michelle, do you have, you have some more stuff you want to do that? Um, oh, the general conditions. There you go. Yep. Um, I have to do the calculation for like the lesser of the actual amount of 75%. Yep, hang on. So I'll just do one, okay? I'm going to do the first one and you guys can finish the rest, okay? Three, so charitable donations. It's uh, 2010, 2008. How'd you do 2008? Um, lesser of 23,000 and 75% of the actual amount of 75%. Okay. Um, and then the other one is the dividend Paid, which was how much? 23? And to 75. Oh, crap. What, what happened there? Paid twenty three to seventy five per cent of division B income, which equals point seven five times how much? One hundred one point seven five. One hundred one point seven five, which equals seventy six point three one three. Okay, so the last row is twenty three. Okay, you guys have to show that calculation that you know how to do it once. Okay, don't you don't have to spend pages and pages of Things. Just make sure that we know that you're showing the lesser of. So this will be 23, what was it, 23? Yeah. Then this will be 9, obviously the lesser of 75% uh, of that and 9 is 9, 0. The lesser of 75% of 82 and 13. That is how much? Uh, 13. I would agree with you normally, Michelle. The only problem is the cash. Right, so right over here, you're going to put 13 current year plus 3 carry forward, 16. Okay, so remember, car uh, charitable donations you can carry forward five years, right? Okay, what else you got? Michelle, you want to do the next one? Yeah, the vast majority of time you would take the net capital losses because they're very restricted and how you can use them. You have some capital gains. Normally, most people would take those, right? So you're going to go net capital losses. Yep. So basically, there was the balance of 13.5. Yeah, hang on here. Let me just go back up here. Net capital loss carry forward. Okay, so how much did you have? Um, from 1999, there was 13,500. Yep. So I have to convert it to the rate decimal. So first I multiply it by. I think three quarters. Okay. So 13.5. Times three quarters times half. Michelle, you gonna multiply it by three quarters? Divide. Don't do that. Just multiply by the research. Like, make it bigger, right? So basically, multiply by four over three. You always know that it's going to get bigger, and then you're going to multiply it by one half. How much is that number? How much? Right? So you have 9,000. So 9,000 carry forward. How much are we going to deduct? Right. So less deduct in 2008 to 2009, zero, right? So we're gonna go back up here. Your nine's here, right? You got a $9,000 inclusion, right? So you're allowed the lesser of the carry forward balance and the net taxable capital gains for the year of nine. So you're nine. So you have to make sure you have to show that lesser of calculation, right? Okay, what are you gonna do for 2009? We had a loss carry forward, right? So we're gonna go up here, we're gonna just add that to the pool, right? We're gonna go over here. 2009 
net capital loss was how much? Two. Then we're going to go back and say, okay. So we can't claim anything there, obviously. Zero here, zero here. Or oh, sorry, I shouldn't do that. Because what we did was we actually, um, we actually took that loss here, right? Right here. So that 1.5, we took the net capital loss by adding it to the non-capital loss calculation. So we have to take out that here. So 1.5 1. 1. claim in 2009 to 2010, it's 0.5, right? And then basically for 2010, you're gonna go 0.5, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take $500 off in 2005, the remainder. So you're gonna just say something like this, right? Just show the marker you know what you're doing. So you're gonna go here, you're gonna say 2010, or 11 claim, lesser of uh, balance, 0.5, and two, um, the taxable capital gains in 2010, which was how much? Uh, 9,000, so the lesser of is 0.5, so to 2012 is zero, okay? Okay, almost done ladies, and this will be on, right? The last piece of the puzzle, what are we gonna do, Arnold? This allocates the non-capital non, uh, uh, non losses of 75K, and you just carry it. So let's just make sure we understand how to do that, okay? So we're all done, the only thing left is, we still have, we still have some income subject to tax, where is it here? Right here, this minus this minus this minus this, right? It comes up, to, let's look at the number. What's the number for 2008? Uh, See you guys, good luck. Thanks. 27,250. Okay, so 101.750 minus the deductions you've taken so far is 27,500, right? Or 27,250? Yeah. So what we're gonna do is, your non-capital loss, sorry guys, I run out of room here. So your non-cap loss, is 27.250, that'll get you to zero. So taxable income is zero. So what you're gonna go now, I'll, uh, I'll try to make that prettier when, I, uh, when I'm done here. You're, don't forget, you're gonna go back and do your, your pool here, and you're gonna go less 2008 applied, 27, 27.250, 2009 applied, which is how much? 23. How much? 23. Uh, 2010, we had a loss. 2011 applied. And you can only take the remaining balance. Lesser of one remaining balance, which is how much? Uh, 24.750. 24.750. And Uh, oh, 55, no, 55, income remaining, which is how much? 55? Yep. So you're going to do 24.750, zero. zero. 2012. Okay? So I will print it up. Go ahead, go do your stuff. I'll, I'll make this up here to make it a little bit better for you. Okay? But the long short of it is make sure you follow the, the chart like that. you got to follow the chart. Okay, thanks guys. Good luck. 31.5. So this, this 54.5 minus 22.5 minus nine gets you 31.5 is 23. So that's 23, which we've deducted. That gets you to zero. That's to zero. This is already zero. This was the last amount that we were allowed, that we had left, was 24,750. 24.7750. So the only year we have taxable income is 2011, and that is uh, 30.25, and that should be good to go.